Welcome back to HPE Discover 2021, the virtual version. My name is Dave Vellante and you're watching theCUBE. And we're here with Guido Appenzeller, who's the CTO of the Data Platforms Group at Intel. Guido, welcome to theCUBE, come on in. Uh, thanks Dave, I appreciate it. It's great to be here today. So I'm interested in, in your, your role at the company. Let's talk about that, you're brand new. Tell us a little bit about your background. What attracted you to Intel and what's your role here? Yeah, so I'm, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the startup ecosystem of Silicon Valley, came for my PhD and, and, and never left. And, uh, you know, built, built software companies, worked at software companies, worked at VMware for a little bit. And I think my, my initial reaction when the Intel recruiter called me was like, hey, you got the wrong phone number, right? I'm, I'm a software guy. That's probably not who you're looking for. And, uh, but, you know, we had a good conversation. I think at Intel, you know, there's a, there's a realization that you need to look at um, what, what Intel builds more as an overall system. Uh, from a systems perspective, right? That you that the software stack and then the hardware components are getting more and more intricately linked, and uh, you know you need the software to basically bridge across the uh, the different hardware components that Intel is building. So I'm I'm here now as the the CTO for the Data Platforms Group, so that builds the data center products uh, here at Intel, and uh, it's it's a really exciting job. Right? These are exciting times at Intel, you know, with with Pat, uh, you know, got a fantastic. Uh, you know, CEO uh, at the helm. Uh, I worked with him before at VMware, so uh, a lot of things to do. Um, but uh, I think a very exciting future. Well, I mean, the, the the data center is the wheelhouse of Intel. I mean, of, of course, you your ascendancy was a function of the the PCs and the, the great volume and how you changed that industry. But really, data centers is where. It, I mean, I remember the days when people say Intel will never be in the data center. It's just a toy, and of course, <laughs> you're a dominant player there now. So your initial focus here is is really defining the vision. Uh, and, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on the future, what the data center looks like in the future, where you see Intel playing a role. What, what are you seeing as the big trends there? You know, Pat, Pat Gelsinger talks about the waves. He says, if you don't ride the waves, you're going to end up being driftwood. So what are the waves you're driving? What's different about the data center of the future? Yeah, that's right. You want to surf the waves, right? That's the, the, the way to do it. The, so look, I like to look at this in, in sort of in terms of major macro trends, right? And I think that the biggest thing that's happening um, in the market right now is is the cloud revolution, right? And I think we're we're halfway through or something like that. And this transition from the classic, uh, um, you know, client server type model, uh, you know, that we're with with enterprises running their own data centers to more of a cloud model where something is you know run by, by hyperscale operators or it may be run uh, you know by a, a by an enterprise themselves or it may sit at the edge. So there's there's a variety of different models. But the, the provisioning models have changed, right? Uh, it's it's much more of a, of a of a turnkey type service, and when when we started out on this journey, I think the we built data centers the same way that we built them before. Although you know the the, the way to deliver IT had really changed, right? It's gone to more of a service model, and we're really now starting to see the hardware diverge, right? The, the actual silicon that we need to build in order to address these use cases um, diverge, and um, so I think one of the the things that is, is kind of most interesting for me is really to think through how does Intel in the future build silicon that's that's built for clouds, you know, like on-prem clouds, edge clouds, uh, you know, hyperscale clouds, but basically built for these new use cases that, uh, that that have emerged. So just a quick, kind of a quick aside. I mean, to me, the definition of cloud is changing. It's evolving. You know, it used to be this set of remote services in a hyperscale data center. It's now you know, that experience is coming on-prem, it's connecting across clouds, it's moving out to the edge, it's supporting, you know, all kinds of different workloads. How, how do you see that evolving cloud? Yeah, I think, I mean, there, there's, the biggest difference to me is that sort of a, a cloud starts with this idea that the infrastructure operator and the tenant are separate. Right, and and that is actually has major architectural implications. I mean, just to, uh, you know, I'm not sure this is a perfect analogy, but, but if, if I build a single family home, Right, where everything is owned by one party, uh, you know, I want to be able to walk from the kitchen to the living room pretty quickly, if that makes sense. Right, so you know, in my house here, it's actually an open kitchen. Right, it's the same room essentially. If you're building a hotel where your primary goal is to have guests, you you pick a completely different architecture. Right, the the, the kitchen from from your restaurants where the cooks are busy preparing the food, and the dining room where the, where the guests are sitting, they're separate. Right, I mean, the, the, the hotel staff has a dedicated place to work, and the guests have a dedicated places to mingle, but they they don't overlap. Typically, I think it's the same thing with architecture in the clouds, right? That's sort of you know initially the assumption was it's all one thing, and now suddenly we're starting to see, you know, like a, a much much cleaner separation of of these uh, different different areas. I think a, a second major 
influence is that the, the type of workloads we're seeing is just evolving incredibly quickly, right? I mean, you know, 10 years ago, uh, you know, things were mostly monolithic. Today, you know, most new workloads are microservice based. And that, that has a huge impact in, uh, you know, where, where CPU cycles are spent, uh, you know, where we need to put in accelerators, you know, how we, how we build silicon for that to, you know, give you an idea. I mean, the, the, there's some really good research out of Google and Facebook where they run numbers. And for example, on, if you just take a, a standard system and you run a, a, a microservice based, an application written in a microservice based architecture, uh, you can spend anywhere from, I want to say 25, in some cases over 80% of your CPU cycles just on overhead. Right? And just on, you know, marshalling, demarshalling the protocols and, uh, you know, the, the encryption and decryption of the packets and your service mesh that sits in between all these things, right, create a, a huge amount of overhead. So, so for us, right, if 80% go into these, uh, into these overhead functions, really our focus only needs to, to be uh, on, on how do we enable um, that kind of infrastructure. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit more about workloads if we can. I mean, you, you, the overhead, there's also sort of, as the software, as the data center becomes software defined, you know, thanks, thanks to your good work at, at VMware, it, it, there's a lot of cores that are supporting that software defined data center. And then- That's as, exactly right, yeah. And as well, you mentioned microservices, uh, container-based applications, but, but as well, you know, AI's coming into play and, and what, what it is, you know, AI is kind of amorphous, but it's really data oriented workloads versus kind of general purpose ERP and finance and HCM. So those workloads are exploding and then we can maybe talk about the edge. How are you seeing the workload mix shift and, and how is Intel playing there? Look, I think the trend you're talking about is definitely right, right? We're getting more and more data centric, you know, shifting the data around becomes a larger and larger part of the overall um, workload in the data center. Uh, AI is getting a ton of attention, right? It's, uh, look, if, if I talk to the um, most operators, AI is still an emerging category, right? I mean, we're seeing, I'd say five, maybe 10% uh, percent of workloads being AI. Um, it's growing, they're very high value workloads, right? And they're very challenging workloads. Um, but, uh, you know, it's still a, a smaller part uh, of the overall mix. Now, edge, edge is big, right? And edge, edge is two things, it's, it's big and it's complicated because the way I think about edge is it's not just one homogeneous market, it's really a collection of separate sub-markets, right? Uh, it's, it's very heterogeneous, uh, you know, it runs on a variety of different hardware, right? Edge can be everything from, uh, you know, a little a little server that's fanless, that's strapped to a, a, a you know a phone, a telephone pole with an antenna on top, you know, to create a microcell, or it can be you know something that's running inside a car, right? I mean, uh, you know, a uh, modern car has a small little data center inside. Uh, it can be something that runs on an industrial factory floor, right? The network operators. There's a pretty broad range of, of verticals that all look slightly different in in their requirements, and um, uh, you know, and it's uh, I think it's really interesting, right? It's, it's one of those areas that really creates opportunities. For for vendors like uh, like HPE, right, to 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 really shine and and address this this heterogeneity with a with a broad range of uh, solutions. Very excited to work together with them in that space. Yeah, so I'm glad you brought HPE into the discussion because we're here at HPE Discover. I want to connect them. But so my question is, what's the role of the data center in this this world of edge? How do you see it? Yeah, look, I, I think. In a sense, what the cloud revolution is doing is that it, it, it's showing us a, 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 it leads to polarization of a classic data into edge and cloud, if that makes sense, right? It's splitting, right? Before this was all mingled a little bit together. If my data center is my basement anyways, you know, what's edge, what's data center, it's the same thing, right? The moment I'm moving some workloads in the clouds and I don't even know where they're running anymore, then some other workloads that have to have a certain sense of locality, I need to keep closely, right? And, and there's some workloads you just, just can't move into the cloud, right? I mean, there's, uh, if I'm generating a large amount of video data that I have to process, it's you know financially completely unattractive to shift all of that uh, you know to to a central location. I want to do this locally, right? And will I ever connect my my uh, my smoke detector with my sprinkler system via the cloud? No, I won't, right? <laughs> it's uh, just uh, for if things go bad, right? They uh, that may not work anymore. So I need something that that does this locally. So I think there's many reasons, you know, why why you want to um, keep something uh, on 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 premises. And um, uh, I think it's a uh, I think it's a growing market, right? Uh, it's, it's it's very exciting. You know, we're, we're doing some some um, you know, very good stuff uh, with the uh, friends at HPE. You know, they they have the uh, Proline DL one ten Gen ten plus server uh, with our latest uh, third generation Xeons in them. Uh, the Open RAN, uh, you know, which is the uh, radio access network for in the, in the telco space. Uh, HPE Edge line servers, also with third generation Xeons, so some really really nice products there that I think can really help. Um, addressing enterprises, carriers, a number of different organizations, uh, you know, these, these edge use cases. 
Can you explain, you mentioned Open RAN, VRAN, it, it, should we essentially think of that as kind of the software-defined telco? Yeah, exactly. It's a software-defined cellular, right? I mean, um, you know, I actually, I learned a, a lot about that uh, over the recent months. You know, when, when, when I was taking these classes at Stanford, you know, uh, these things were still dying, doing, done in analog, right? That basically a radio signal would be processed in an analog way and, and digested. And today, typically, the radio signal is, is immediately digitized and all the processing of the radio signal happens, uh, uh, happens digitally. And, uh, you know, it happens on servers, right? Uh, um, some of them HPE servers. And uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a really interesting use case where we're basically now able to do something in a much, much more efficient way by moving it to a, a, you know, a digital, more modern platform. And it turns out you can actually then virtualize these servers and you know, run uh, a number of different cells um, inside the same server. Right? And it's, it's really complicated because you have to have fantastic real-time guarantees, very sophisticated software stack. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really fascinating use case. You know, a lot of times we have these debates and it's, it's maybe somewhat academic, but I'd love to get your thoughts on it. The debate is about, okay, how much data that, that is you know, processed and inferred at the edge is actually going to come back to the cloud. Most of the data is going to stay at the edge. A lot of it's not even going to be persisted. And the counter to that is, so that's sort of the, the negative for the, you know, the data center, but the, the counter to that is there's going to be so much data, even a small percentage of all the data that we're going to create is going to create so much more data, you know, back in the cloud, back in the data center. What's your take on that? Look, I think there's different applications that are easier to do in certain places, right? I mean, the, look, the, the, the going to a large cloud has a couple of advantages. You have a very, a complete software ecosystem around you, you know, lots of different services. Um, you have, for if you need very specialized hardware, if I want to run a big learning task where I suddenly need a thousand machines, right? And then and, and this runs for a couple of days and then I don't need to do that for, uh, for another month or two, right? For that is really great. There's on-demand infrastructure, right? Having, having all this capability up there. Uh, you know, at the same time, it, it costs money to send the data up there, right? Um, if I uh, just look at the hardware cost, it's much, much cheaper. To, to build it myself, uh, you know, in my own data center or in the edge. Um, so uh, I think we'll we'll we'll, we'll see, um, you know, customers picking and choosing what they want to do where, right? And and there's a role for both, right? Uh, absolutely. And and so you know, I think there's there's certain categories. I mean, at the end of the day, um, th why do I absolutely need to have something at the edge? And there's a couple of I think good good use cases. I mean, one is. And this, let me actually rephrase a little bit. I think it's three primary reasons, right? Um, one is simply a bandwidth, right? Where I'm saying, okay, my, my video data, like I have, I have 100 4K video cameras, uh, you know, with 60 frames a second feeds. There's no way I'm going to move that into the cloud. It's just, you know, cost prohibitive. Right. Uh, I, have, I have a hard line, uh, time even getting a line that allows me to do this, right? Um, there might be latency, right? If I want to reliably react a very sh a short period of time. I can't do that in the cloud. Right? I need to do this uh, locally with me. Um, I can't even do this in my data center. Right? This has to be very, very closely coupled. And uh, you know, then there's this idea of fate sharing. I think you know, that if uh, I want to make sure that if things go wrong, right, uh, uh, the system is still intact, right? You know, anything that's sort of an emergency kind of uh, backup, uh, you know, an emergency type procedure, right? If, if things go wrong, I can't rely on there being a good internet connection. I need to handle things things locally, right? You know, uh, that's the, the the smoke detector and the, the sprinkler system, right? And um, so for 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 all of these, right? There's good reasons why we need to move things close to the edge, right? So I think there'll be a creative tension between the two, right? Um, but uh, both are, are huge markets, and I think there's there's great opportunities for for HP uh, ahead to uh, uh, you know to to work on on all these use cases. Yeah, for sure, you know, top brand in that compute business. Uh, so before we wrap up today, you know, thinking about your, your role, I mean, part of your role is a trend spotter, you know, right? You gotta, you're, you're kind of driving innovation, riding, surfing the waves, as you said, you know, skating to the puck, all the- I have my, all I have the, my perfect crystal ball right here. Yeah, go yeah, on. <laughs> all the cliches, right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Puts a little pressure on you. But so what are some of the things that you're overseeing that you're, you're looking towards in terms of innovation projects, particularly obviously in the data center space, what's really exciting yeah. you? Look, I mean, uh, there's a lot of them and I, I, I pretty much all the, you know, the interesting ideas I get from talking to customers, right? You talk to, to the, 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 the sophisticated customers, you try to understand the problems that they're trying to solve and that they can't solve right now. And that, that gives you ideas. And to, um, just to pick a couple, right? I mean, one thing, um, one area I'm currently th thinking about a lot is, is how can we build, in a sense, better accelerators for the infrastructure functions, right? So, so no matter if I run an edge cloud or I run a, a big public cloud, 
I want to find ways how I can I can reduce the amount of uh, CPU cycles I, I I spent on you know microservice marshaling, demarshaling, service mesh, uh, you know storage acceleration, and these things like that, right? And so we clearly, if if this is a large chunk of the overall uh, um, cycle budget, right, we need to find ways to 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 shrink that, right, to to make this more efficient, right? So that I think so this this basically infrastructure function acceleration. It sounds probably as unsexy as any topic could sound, but I think this is actually a really really interesting area. One of the big levers we have right now in the data center. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I would right. agree, Guido. I think that's actually really exciting because you know you actually can 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 pick up a lot of the wasted cycles now, and that's just that drops right to the bottom line. But please, yeah, exactly. Please, please, and, and it's, yeah. I mean, it's you know it's kind of funny. I mean, we're, we're still measuring so much with spec and rates of CPUs, right? Performance is like well, <laughs> they may actually we may actually be measuring the wrong thing, right? If eighty percent of the cycles of my app are spent in, in overhead, right, then the, the the speed of the CPU doesn't matter as much, right? It's it's, it's other functions that I need to matter. Right. So that's one. Um, the, the second big one is memory is becoming a bigger and bigger issue, right? And, and it's, it's, it's memory cost because, you know, memory prices, they used to sort of decline at the, the, the same rate that, you know, our core counts and then, and, 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 you know, clock speeds increased. That's no longer the case, right? We've run to some scaling limits there, some physical scaling limits where memory prices are becoming stagnant. And this is becoming a major pain point for, for everybody who's building servers, right? So I think we need to find ways how we can leverage memory more efficiently, right? Uh, you know, share memory more efficiently. We have some really cool ideas uh, in, in that space uh, that, that we're working on. Well, yeah, and Pat, let me just, sorry to interrupt, but Pat hinted to that in your big announcement. I mean, you talk about system on package, I think is what he used to talk about what I call disaggregated memory and better sharing of that memory resource. And I mean, that it seems to be a clear benefit of value creation for the industry. Exactly, right? I mean, it's, it's, if this becomes a larger, we, if for our customers, this becomes a larger part of their overall cost, right? We want to help them um, address that issue. And, you know, and then the, the third one is, um, uh, you know, we're seeing um, more and more data center operators that are effectively power limited, right? So we need to reduce the overall power of systems or, you know, uh, maybe to some degree, just figure out better ways of cooling these systems. But I think there's a, uh, there's a lot of innovation that can be done there, right? To both um, make these data centers more economical, but, you know, also to make them a little more green, right? I mean, today, uh, data centers have gotten big enough that if you look at the the total amount of energy that we're spending in this world as mankind, right, a, a chunk of that is going just to data centers, right? And so, if we're if we're spending energy at that scale, right, I think we have to start thinking about how can we build data centers that are more energy efficient, allows to do the same thing with less energy in the future. Well, thank you for for laying those out. I mean, you guys have been long term partners with with HP and now, of course, HPE. I'm sure Gelsinger is really happy to have you on board, Guido. I would be. And uh, thanks so much for coming on the cube. It was great to be here. Uh, great to be at the HPE show. <laughs> and thanks for being with us for HPE Discover 2021, the virtual version. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in digital tech coverage. Be right back.